Once again, good evening. It's uh, such a blessing to be here with you folks tonight. and I'd like to uh, have our final lesson or message on the acronym TULIP tonight. We often call it Perseverance of the Saints, and that's what has been brought down to us. But tonight I'd like to rename it <clears throat> The Lord God Almighty Presenting Saints Spotless. It is His ministry and His purpose to present all those whose names were written down in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, and that the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world and the Holy Spirit promised to go and uh, raise them from their spiritual death, that He would give them the new birth that has been the purpose of the great theme of grace, that in the end, none would be lost. The dear pastor that brought me the gospel many years ago shared with me, he does not debate or argue eternal security or perseverance of the saints. He said it just boils down to this, who saved you? If you saved you, you will fall away. If God saved you, you shall be presented spotless. This subject, one old theologian said, the scriptures declare <clears throat> that in virtue of all the original purpose and continuous operation of God, all who are united to Christ by faith, will infallibly continue in a state of grace and will finally attain to everlasting life. Those who are truly regenerated, effectually called, and really converted, and internally sanctified by the Spirit and grace of God, shall persevere in grace to the end, and shall be everlastingly saved, or shall never finally and totally fall, so as to perish everlastingly. Perseverance of the saints is declared throughout all the scriptures, and boils down to who saved you. As that pastor said, if you saved you, you will be eternally lost. If you had anything to do whatsoever with your salvation, you will be eternally lost unless God should work a work of grace. If God saved you, you will be eternally saved. If believers are left to stand on their own merits and on their own righteousness, they would fall away. Turn with me, if you would, tonight in the scriptures to the book of John. John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and I'd like to read three verses there, beginning with verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27, 28, and 29. My sheep hear my voice. These are the words of the Lord Jesus as he's teaching. He taught his disciples at that time. He's taught his disciples all down through the ages. And he continues to teach his disciples from the same wonderful words of life that he brought as if it has as much it has as much vitality, has as much life today in the Word of God to the saints as it did then. And these words may not have been brought exactly in the Old Testament by the mouth of the Lord Jesus, but the principle is found throughout all the scriptures that my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There's a whole group of folks today in religion that don't believe that God is strong enough, that Christ's word is effectual enough, and that the Holy Spirit's power is powerful enough to lead his people to the end. They think that they save them and then turn them loose, but that's not what God does. He has loved his people with an everlasting love, and he will continue to love them. They, he has loved them in old eternity. He loves his people today, and he will forever love his people and he cannot and will not let them eternally fall away. Going on in verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life. My sheep, I give unto them eternal life. 
and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And I've had people tell me, well, you can pluck yourself. That's if you've saved yourself. If you are depending upon your own works and righteousness, if you're depending upon your own works of merit, your own sanctification, then that's true. But if you have Jesus Christ and you're depending completely and wholly upon his blood and righteousness, then no man can pluck you out of his hand, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So the promise is given to us that as the work of grace goes out through all generations, from the very beginning, there um, Adam and Eve and Abel and down to today, wherever the sheep are being saved, this promise is given to them. My sheep hear my voice. I give unto them eternal life. No thing, nothing is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And once again, we just have to interject here. It all depends on who saved you. If you're saved by your own works and righteousness, yes, you will fall away. There will be no way that you could stand before God in that merit. But if you've been saved by the grace of God through the preaching of the truth of the gospel and the Holy Spirit has regenerated you and given you life, then you will persevere to the end. My sheep hear my voice. This wonderful teaching is based upon a central theme of the Bible and Jonah succinctly with such clarity in that great time of distress in his life when he was in that great fish's belly summed it up when he said salvation is of the Lord beginning to end he is the alpha and omega he is the author and finisher of our faith he as it tells us not and I'll just like to go over to the book of Hebrews at this point and read the scriptures there that share this wonderful truth about the Lord and about salvation and about God and about what he performs and does. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the ender. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the A and the Z. He is the all and in all. Salvation is in him. As Simeon said, I have seen the Lord's salvation. It is a person. He is a person. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That means that he was absolutely successful, and that is symbolized to us, shared with us, declared to us that he sat down. The work is finished. He cried, it is finished from the cross. And that means the work of redemption is complete. Every prophecy of the Old Testament was fulfilled. Every declaration that was made in the law was fulfilled. And Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. In John chapter 5 Turn with me to the book of John chapter 5 as we read here. John chapter 5 and there in verse 24, this wonderful word of God once again shares with us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. When we compare scripture with scripture, we find that the only way that we'll ever hear the word is that God opens our spiritual ears. We may hear it with our physical ears for years. We may go through our entire life hearing the word of God with our physical ears. But when the Holy Spirit reveals the word to us, the preaching of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, 
There's none other name given under heaven, given among men whereby we must be saved. But this name, if we ever are privileged to hear that, then God has opened our ears that we might hear. And he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There's uh, a... A trend that I noticed when I was in religion when I was a kid, and it's been there for, uh, I suppose, ever since the very beginning, that those who made a profession of faith in order to keep them in line and that the Holy Spirit wasn't powerful enough, if you did something wrong, the preacher would declare from the pulpit or in your face and say, you're going to have to answer for that. My friends, if we have to answer for one sin, we are lost. Sin was taken care of by Jesus Christ on the cross. It doesn't give us a license for sin, and that's what the Apostle Paul was bringing up when he wrote to the Romans that there's a whole bunch of folks, and they are around today. One man told me, if I believed what you believed, I would go out and do this sin. Well, you know, if if you believe what the truth of the Word of God says, the Holy Spirit is able to, to put a restraining hand about us. Now, we sin a whole lot more than we ever want to. God's people sin, and we wish we could be without it. And we wake up every day saying, Lord, keep me from it. But we have this nature that was given to us in the fall, and we'll carry it to our grave, and it sins, it rebels, but that which indwells us, the Holy Spirit indwells us, that is the what uh, allows us to hear the word of God, and that's what allows us to persevere to the end. It's not our righteousness, but it's Christ's righteousness. And it says, shall not come into condemnation. Never again. Who is it that will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So all that say, all humans, everything, everybody, ourselves included, Who can bring any charge against God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So we trust God in this matter. He hath everlasting life, it says here, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The problem with people who don't believe in this perseverance of the saints or eternal security or however you want to put it, is that they have not passed from death unto life, and they're depending upon their own works and their own righteousness to make God accept them. In the book of Hebrews chapter 5, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Let's turn there to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. And in verse 25, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore, on the basis of all that's gone on, wherefore he, God, is able to save Uh, able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able also to save them to the uttermost. This wonderful declaration of the word of God magnifies the Father who predestinated his children to salvation, as well as Jesus Christ, who has become the mediator of this covenant. He lived for us He died for us, and he rose again for us. And the Holy Spirit, who regenerates, reveals, and restores restores the broken fellowship lost in Adam, the triune God ever works, ever has worked, and continues on our behalf to do all that is required and all that is necessary for us to have eternal life. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, Backing up a little bit to the book of Romans chapter 8, and we read here in verse 1, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If we have a tendency all our life to walk after the flesh, then No doubt, we have never been regenerated. It is the regeneration that God gives us through the preaching of the gospel, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that raises us from death into life, that that is what gives us this life. 
And also in the book of Romans, down there in verse 33, Romans chapter 8, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. God has done this work. He's taken it to the courtroom of the justice of God, and all his people has been found justified. Just as just Lot, just Noah, just Abraham, just justified. The saints have been justified before God. Verse 30, for who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to take God's word for it. Or we won't. We don't have to see Noah's ark to believe that it was there. By faith, we believe that God preserved those folks in the ark. We don't have to be in the days of Christ. I have people telling me how they're looking forward to going over to the Holy Land. There is no Holy Land. The Holy Land is at New Jerusalem, at the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to go see the tomb. We don't have to go see the place where he's crucified. We don't have to go see the place where he was born. That's of no interest to believers that they are going to depend on that to confirm their faith. My goodness, the word of God, by the grace of God, and by the Holy Spirit, by the Son, by the Father, confirms our faith in the Lord Jesus. In Psalm 125, Way back in the Psalms, in the Old Testament there, in Psalm 125, much said in the Old as well as the New about this wonderful subject that it is really God's salvation. And he has much at stake. His word is at stake. Can he keep his word? Yes, he can. And he will. And he will present spotless all those that he has chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Psalm 125 and verse uh, 1 and 2. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forevermore. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Notice that they trust in the Lord, not in the creature, and no, not in the creature's services or works. The Lord is around about his people. He is the one that preserves his people. He's the one that makes them presentable. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Let's go back to the New Testament here. Another letter that Paul was used to pen. But remember always, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. He used Paul to pen them. We have it here now in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful, by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. We are often like saints recorded in the Old Testament as well as the New. David, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Aaron, the list goes on and on and on. You bring up a crime against God and saints have committed it. Peter denied the Lord three times. 
And yet the Lord said, I pray for you. He never prayed a word for Judas. Judas did far less in many ways than Peter ever did. But Peter was the Lord's. And he kept him. He preserved him. Came to him. Peace be unto you. Peter, do you love me? And Peter finally confessed, Lord, thou knowest. That's the truth of the matter. It's not by our ability to say, I love Jesus, I love God. But he knows. He's created that life within us. Kept by the power of God is what we read over here in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God. Now, when we went over uh, in this series about who is the one, he's the Lord God Almighty. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Who are kept by the power of God. The believers depend upon God's power every day. And we are kept by that very power. The very person of God, his character, his attributes demand that all he chose in Christ before the foundation of the world will finally be presented spotless before his great presence. Jude. Oh, this wonderful book of Jude over here. Jude, uh, one chapter here, but it's just filled. Verses 24 and 25. As he comes to the conclusion of this book. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He's able to keep us from falling. He is able. He, we are kept by the power of God. It was his power that raised his people from the death, lifted them out of the pit, brought them to Christ. It is his power, the same power it took to raise Christ is the power that he uses to raise his people from the spiritual dead. And this wonderful thought about it is his power. We're kept by the power of God and he's able to present a spotless. And again, in the book of Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Second Timothy chapter 1 for verse 12 for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He's able to keep that which I've committed. God is so powerful. Almighty God, the God, Lord God Almighty, we are kept by him. We are delivered by him. We're raised by him. We're made spotless by him. It is his righteousness. It is his blood that was shed. It is his payment that was made. And therefore, we are secure in him. It's his promise. It is his promise. Saints' perseverance demands, depends on God and his word. He has made the promise. He is powerful enough to keep his promise. We fail in that. We don't, we, we, we don't intend to many times, but we just fail. We cannot keep what we promised. But God is powerful enough to keep what he promised. Saints' perseverance depends on the power of God. He is powerful enough to keep what he has said. He's able to do all things according and everlastingly to his perfect will. Saints' perseverance depends on God's electing love. We didn't elect God. He chose us in him. And we love him because he first loved us. And we chose him because he first chose us. And we have all things because he had all things for us in Christ Jesus. Saints' perseverance depends on the believer's union with Christ. We've been grafted in. We are uni at union with him. He is the head. We're the body. 
and where the head is, the body will soon follow. Saints perseverance depends on the nature of the purchase. What was the purchase price? Not works of righteousness, which we have done, but, but it was his precious blood that was the purchase price, and it will not go wasted. It will go absolutely redeeming. There is a redeemer that actually pays the price of our redemption, and his name is Jesus. Uh, the, 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 nobody is going to fall away except those who are called, as Jesus did with Judas, the son of perdition. They're the ones that will fall away. Those that were never chosen, those who were never quickened, those who were never heard the gospel, they're religious, and when they stand before God, those the, the great separation of sheep and goats, as is recorded in the book of Matthew, those that on the right hand were declared welcome to the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. When he begins to delineate and lay out the things that they performed, they said, when did we do those things? It's not something that God's people keep track of. They don't have notebooks. They don't write it down and say, well, I helped this person today. I served God today. It, that, it's not works of righteousness, which we have done. We do what God determines that we will do because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So when it comes to that time, we will never say, oh, I, I did so much for you. The church will say, when did we do that? But those goats on the left-hand side, they're so quick to say, we did all of that. We did all of that. We did all of that. We built. We had hospitals. We had gymnasiums. We had all of these things. And we raised the dead. And we removed mountains. And we, we, we did all of these things. When did we not do those things? And the Lord Jesus Christ, because they're depending upon their own righteousness, their own self-righteousness, their own works of righteousness, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. So those on the right hand, those sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, because they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Those that are, uh, that are as, as declared there, the, the son of perdition, I've lost none except the son of perdition. Uh, the book of Proverbs declares to us in chapter 16, verse 4, He hath made all things, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. And he receives glory in that. He has no, no great joy in the death of the wicked. But he will receive glory in this. And let me, as I close, bring up something, a, a false teaching that has crept into the church over the last centuries, no doubt. Maybe it's been always around. And that is to take something that is brought up with regard to Israel, and that's the word backsliding, and apply it to people that have made a profession of faith, that had an experience or had uh, some religious thing happen to them, and... You know, they just can't hang on, and soon they leave, and they're off in the world, and they're doing their thing, and they spend the rest of their life doing that. This is not what backsliding is. God's people, in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, had those days, those moments, those periods of time, when even as Peter denied the Lord, but he wept bitterly. God did not leave him outside for the rest of his life. He continuously woos his people. I, I will woo them. I'll bring them in. I'll attract them. I'll bring them back. But this, this is only to those that have come to Christ or accepted Jesus, and they go on, and then their parents and the preachers and Husbands and wives say, well, they're just backslidden. They're just backslidden. They know Jesus, but they're just backslidden. No, they don't know Christ. God does a better job than that. I remember hearing about an old preacher and 
somebody in the congregation came up to him and said, do you remember me? You I was saved in one of your meetings, and he said it must have been because God does a better job than that. Well, God does the work of grace, and his people that he works a work of grace in, he will deliver spotless before the throne of grace. He is a great God. He works all things after the counsel of his own will, and we rest in him. He is the architect of salvation. He is the completion of salvation. And he will have his people brought before him. There will not be uh, one empty chair, if I can use that term, before his presence. And there will not be one chair extra, one chair too many. It will all be filled. All of his people will be presented spotless. And every one of them will sing the songs of Zion. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We depend upon His work, His blood, His purpose, His love, everything. We depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you and trust you'll have a good week.